uh, granting us your word, what a gift you've given us in the written word of God. And we pray that you would open our eyes to the things that are here and that we would see more than um, regulations and laws, but we would see your love and your call to us and your holiness and the fact that you make us clean in Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for this time. We ask that you would teach us in Jesus' name. Amen. So at what point can something be called clean? The definition may change depending on the circumstance. You look down your hands, you don't see any dirt, you think, okay, I'm, I'm clean. But, you know, when it's time to uh, go eat dinner, you want to go wash up, right? There's another thing, uh, another level when you start using that antibacterial fluid like some people are rubbing on their hands right now. I do the same thing, right? Sicknesses start going around, you want to be extra clean. Still another thing, when a surgeon is scrubbing up and prepping for an operation. Different levels of clean, right? What's considered clean at the dinner table is far different than at the operating room. Cleanliness matters when it comes to matters of physical health. Cleanliness is absolutely crucial when it comes to issues of spirit spiritual health. After all, sin stains, and we need total cleansing if we're to be in a relationship with the infinitely holy God. Now, thankfully, God knows our need. He knows exactly what's needed for us to be cleansed. What's needed is his grace. And this is what we read in the book of Isaiah, verses 118. Come now, of course, he's speaking to Israel. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they're red like crimson, they shall be as wool. To Israel, God offered complete, total cleansing from sin's defilement. To us, he offers exactly the same thing through the sacrifice of his son. Through Jesus' work at the cross and the resurrection, which of course we celebrate this weekend, God cleanses us from every stain and he sets us apart to himself as pure, as holy, as a people ready to be used for his glory. Now we know that happens at the moment of our resurrection, but what happens after that point? Well, we are to continue to live as God's cleansed holy people. And we are just as much dependent on God's grace for that as we were the moment we were first forgiven. Yet for us to understand the extent of the grace that we receive in Jesus, we have to extend the, understand the extent of the defilement that's all around us. It's when we see how unclean we are and the rest of the world is around us, that's when we appreciate the pure, clean holiness of God. It's like the difference you go into a room and it looks clean and then you turn on some special lighting and you put some lamps out in the air and all of a sudden you see the fingerprints and everything all over the place. Once you see how dirty it is, then you can appreciate what it is to be in a truly sterile room, right? That's what we see here. That brings us to these dietary laws of ancient Israel. As the book of Leviticus moves away from the various sacrifices and the consecration of the priesthood, it gets into the nitty-gritty details of the law. And admittedly, these are things that many Christians uh, today wonder what on earth is worth reading in all of this. If Christians are not under the law, why do we need to know the details of the law? If Christians can eat basically what we want, why care about kosher regulations? Why care about clean and unclean animals? Why care, as we see in chapter 12 tonight, what purification rituals took place after childbirth? All of these things may have mattered to the ancient Israelites, but they don't seem to make an impact on the daily lives of Christians today. Or do they? Now, at the very beginning, we need to be very, very clear. No, Christians are not under the law. And specifically when we're talking about this dietary law of Israel, among other things. Jesus specifically says, and we'll look at it later tonight, that what goes into us goes into our mouths, and not what defiles us, and what comes out of our mouths shows what's in our heart. That's what defiles us. We'll see that in Mark chapter 7. Our hearts matter more than our diets because it's our hearts that truly need to be clean. That being said, sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words, as we know. And the dietary laws of Israel, along with its other rituals regarding impurity, are pictures regarding holiness. How might God teach his people on a daily basis to be holy? To be separated and different from all of the pagan cultures that surrounded them? Well, through the picture of food, through the difference between clean and unclean things. 
And by using all the laws of Leviticus chapters 11 all the way through verse uh, chapter 15, as we'll see later on, God gives practical illustrations to his people of the defilement that's in the world all around them and their constant need for God's holiness among them. See, these laws were never meant for Israel to try to prove their goodness. They were given to point out the perfect purity of their God and their ongoing need for God's mercy and God's grace. It's like all the other rules and regulations of Israel. The law serves as their tutor, their schoolmaster, to bring them to Christ. Galatians 3.24 now, at this point in the book of Leviticus, the tabernacle has been built, the various offerings have been instructed, the priests have been consecrated, set apart to serve the Lord God. We covered all of that. Yet the priests were not the only ones set apart to serve God. The same concept applies to the whole nation. All of Israel set apart by God, chosen by him to be his special people. So what happens now is that God tells Moses and Aaron practical ways how the people were to be set apart different from those nations. All right, things surrounded the nation of Israel, constantly threatening to defile them, and they had to rely on the grace and empowerment of God to walk as His holy people. And it's no different with us. In our sin, we're constantly being defiled. Only the work of Jesus cleanses us, making us acceptable to God. So we want to be cleansed, we want to be holy, all by being dependent on Christ. So Leviticus 11 is where we're going to spend the bulk of our time tonight because it's so large here. And it talks about holiness in animals. First, it starts talking about foods that are acceptable and foods that are detestable. Verses 1 through 23 covers all of that. But land animals are found here in verses 1 through 8. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying to them, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, These are the animals which you may eat among all the animals that are on the earth. Among the animals, whatever divides the hoof, having cloven hooves and chewing the cud, that you may eat. Starts off with animals they could eat. And basically anything with the divided hoof and chewing the cud. Now basically, this included most animals they raised, right? Sheep, goats, cows. Included a few they didn't that were in the area. You know, antelope were in that part of the Middle East and a few others. Now, they're not necessarily commanded you must eat these animals, but they were permitted to eat them. No fruits or vegetables are going to be found in this list in chapter 11 at all of what's clean and unclean. Presumably, they're all clean based off the original command of God to Adam back in Genesis chapter 1, verses 29 through 30. Now, that said, although the list of plant food has never been limited, the list of animal food at this point is now narrowed down. You might remember the command God gave to Noah after the flood, just because it's been a while since we've been there, Genesis 9, 3. God said to Noah, every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I've given you all things, even as the green herbs. You know, Noah was aware, uh, at least to some extent, of clean and unclean animals and birds because he offered sacrifices of clean things in Genesis 8.20. But God gave a general command allowing any moving thing to be eaten. Now things are different. Centuries later through Moses, things change. God narrows it down specifically declaring which animals are edible for his people and which ones were not. Now, it begs the question, is God instituting some form of legalism here? No, this isn't legalism. This is sanctification. This is one of the processes by which God set his people apart to be his own special people on earth. Now, remember, they already had a few covenant signs that are evident to the people around them. They had the circumcision and they had a Sabbath day on a weekly basis. But now they also have specific dietary restrictions. And all of these things put together set the Hebrews apart from their neighbors, showing them to be dedicated unto God. Some cultures would practice circumcision, but they would not practice the Sabbath. Other cultures might practice dietary things, but they wouldn't practice this. Put all these things together, and now God's people are truly set apart. Different. And God does call us to be different, doesn't he? Not different in an unpleasant, binding way, but un different as in special. God has designated us for his own through Jesus, being sealed with God the Holy Spirit. So it only makes sense that there are some things in our lives that set us apart from the rest of the world. We might speak differently. We don't use a lot of the coarse language that we hear out in the world. We might dress a little differently, a little bit more modesty than we might see out there. We might watch different movies, that sort of thing. None of that is necessary legalism, though any of that can be pushed to an extreme. But these are all subtle ways of demonstrating our difference. 
We've been set apart to serve God and to point people to God through Jesus, and how we live our lives matters in that regard. So it starts off with what they could eat, all these great things they could do. Verse 4, Nevertheless, these you shall not eat among those who chew the cud, or those that have cloven hooves, the camel, because it chews the cud but does not have cloven hooves, is unclean to you. The rock hyrax, because it chews the cud but does not have cloven hooves, is unclean to you. The hare, because it chews the cud but does not have cloven hooves, is unclean to you. And the swine, though it divides the hoof, having cloven hooves, yet does not chew the cud, is unclean to you. Their flesh you shall not eat, their carcasses you shall not touch. They are unclean to you. So first were animals they could eat, now animals they could not eat. The restrictions, they had to either have no divided hooves but still chew the cud, uh, as with the camel, or they had divided hooves but don't chew the cud, as with the pigs. Now, some animals in this list don't have hooves at all, but they still have divided toes, and that's the general idea. The question remains if they, you know, chew the cud, if they were slowly digesting their food. By the way, you go through this list, and you might ask, what's a rock hyrax, or what's a coney, if you're following along in the King James? I wanted to look it up to see what it is. This cute little bugger, actually, uh, right there. That's a little badger, a prairie dog type animal that's found throughout the Middle East and uh, Africa. It's... Um, Cute to us is actually seen as kind of a pest in a lot of areas of the world today. You also go down this list and you think, well, what are hares and rabbits doing here? Because, you know, they obviously don't chew the cud, but they do make a motion, as with the rock hyrax here, they make a motion with their mouths as if they do, the way they chew up their food. So chewing the cud, that's really more of a visual cue to the Hebrews than a, a precise, you know, physical description. They're looking at how the animal's eating, and by looking at it, they can know whether or not it's clean for consumption. All right? So, a few animals they could not eat. There's the animals on land, but just like they divided these things in Genesis with land, water, and air, we're going to see the same thing here. We see the water animals, starting in verse 9. These you may eat of all that are in the water. Whatever's in the water has fins and scales, whether in the seas or in the rivers, that you may eat. Fish they could eat, most anything that looked like a fish. Now, Hebrews were not necessarily seafaring when it came to the Mediterranean Sea, but they were very competent on the Sea of Galilee and other lakes and rivers that they went by, and they have a thriving fishing industry by the time of Jesus, of course. We see that you know, once they settle into the Promised Land. Pretty much any fish they caught was considered open game. If it looked like a fish, they could eat it. Again, we see here God's not forcing the Hebrews into a certain form of legalism. Look at all this you can eat, and he's giving them this bountiful things. He's just giving them some markers as distinctions on his own people. But in verse 10, But in all the seas or in the rivers that do not have fins and scales, all that move in the water, or any living thing which is on the water, they are an abomination to you. They shall be an abomination to you. You shall not eat their flesh, but you shall regard their carcasses as an abomination. Whatever in the water does not have fins or scales, that shall be an abomination to you. So here are the sea creatures or the fish, generally speaking, they could not eat. Anything without fins and scales, smooth-skinned creatures like eels and octopus, crustaceans like crab and shrimp. Cajun Hebrew is a contradiction in terms. You're not going to find that, all right? They could eat fish fish, not other things. What's the problem with this sort of sea creature? Well, God said here very specifically, it is an abomination to you. All right, what exactly is an abomination? Interestingly, the word that's used here is a different word that's used in most of the prophets, like Ezekiel, when it comes to idolatry. Now, the technical definition is basically the same, but the context on the two words that are used are, are vastly different. With Ezekiel, you had idolatry and various moral practices that were in the land that were abominations, detestable things. But here, this word is used almost exclusively of unclean animals and the state that they bring to the person who eats it. And some lexicons describe this word as a cultic abomination, dealing precisely with their rituals, their religion. Bottom line, what they ate here these animals had a direct effect on a person's relationship with God. Some of us have had experience eating a bad piece of shrimp, and that leaves us with an upset stomach. But eating any piece of shrimp or crab or calamari or whatever became a stumbling block between the Hebrew and his or her God. But why is that? A lot of reasons have been supposed uh, why God labeled certain animals unclean. 
Uh, think of the land animals. Pork is famously dangerous if it's not stored or cooked properly. Shellfish can be dangerous from an uh, aspect of allergies, and they, they're famed for having contamination of various uh, metals and that sort of thing. But even so, not even the Bible specifies the reason for the exclusion of these animals. There's a lot of different health things out there we can look at and point to here and there, but the Bible does not specify those things. Health isn't mentioned at all. The most simple, fundamental reason is just this, obedience. Obedience. God said that these animals as food were off limits, so the Hebrews were to treat them as such. This is part of their separation from the rest of the world. Being clean in their diet illustrated a cleanliness of their heart that was only given them by God. Sometimes God gives us little things to obey simply to give us the chance to obey. Because the more we say yes to God, the easier it becomes. If we take a small step of faith in the little things, then we build our faith to the point where we don't hesitate when it comes to bigger things. You start lifting weights in a gym, you got to start small. And then you progress over time. The more you lift, the easier it becomes to lift. Well, the same thing here. The more you say yes, the easier it becomes to say yes, and the bigger things God gives you to say yes to. Of course, the opposite is true as well, because the more we say no to God in disobedience, the easier that becomes. So we need to beware. All right, so we looked at land animals, sea animals. Now we look at air animals, starting in verse 13. And these you shall regard as an abomination among the birds. They shall not be eaten. They are an abomination. The eagle, the vulture, the buzzard, the kite, the falcon after its kind, every raven after its kind, the ostrich, the short-eared owl, the seagull, the hawk after its kind, the little owl, the fisher owl, the screech owl, the white owl, the jackdaw, the carrion vulture, the stork, the heron after its kind, the hoopoe, and the bat. So all the birds, they vary. It's a very precise list. It's mainly predators and scavengers, though no precise reason is given here. Perhaps it links back to the prohibition against blood. Scavengers and, and predators would have a hard time with that. You might notice, by the way, if you're uh, keen-eyed, bats are included in the list, and bats are mammals. They're not birds. This is not a zoological paper. Okay, God gave the Hebrews general classification. Here is flying creatures, and bats are included are the flying creatures, so we don't need to be nitpicky about that. All right, so out of those three categories, land, sea, air, now we have creeping things or insects, starting in verse 20. All flying insects that creep on all fours shall be an abomination to you, yet these you shall eat of, or these you may eat of any flying insect that creeps on all fours, that which have jointed legs above their feet which, with which to leap on the earth. These you may eat, the locust after its kind, the destroying locust after its kind, the cricket after its kind, and the grasshopper after its kind. But all f other flying insects which have four feet shall be an abomination to you. Now, a lot of American Christians have problems when it comes to the prohibition against pork and you know, shrimp, but they don't have many problems when it comes to the prohibition against bugs. You know, that seems relatively easy for us to keep. But we've got to remember, it's not necessarily that we're elsewhere in the world. Insects are commonly eaten around the world. I believe this is taken in uh, uh, Thailand, and it doesn't come out very well there. But you can see that there's grasshoppers and stuff for sale. I remember being in Cambodia. They had uh, big baskets of giant spiders you could buy and eat, and all kinds of other bugs that you could pick up and Eat if you want to, and from what I understand from the locals, they said, yeah, they just give those to the tourists. <laughs> but people do eat that sort of thing. Now, as a whole, I, these insects, these creatures, were forbidden by the Lord for the Hebrews, with one exception. And you do see uh, crickets and grasshoppers up there. Locusts and those sort of things were allowed. And we think of John the Baptist, ate honey and wild locusts. And for a group of people wandering around in the ancient Near East having access to locusts and crickets meant that there was a constant supply of at least some sort of food available. Fun fact, crickets are an extremely good source of protein, though I don't eat them. There's apparently a growing market for them in the USA. And you start looking for them now, and there's cricket-based cookies, cricket-based protein bars and protein powders and all kinds of stuff, cricket flour. You guys can experiment and let me know how it tastes, because I'm not going to do it. Um, by the way, one other thing, because people get nitpicky about this as well, the fact that the Bible says that they walk about on all fours doesn't mean that the Hebrews couldn't count six legs on an insect and eight legs on an arachnid. 
Um, it's an idiom that just means that it walks on all of its feet or all of its extremities, however many it has. It's a fundamental distinction between humans and other animals, right? We have four extremities, but we walk on two. Uh, the other animals, they walk on all fours, right? Or all eights or however many they have. So that's just an expression here. All right, so there's what they could and could not eat. But let's talk about, generally speaking, animals that are clean and unclean. All right, this is going to be the rest of chapter 11. It starts with the large animals in verses 24 through 28. By these you shall become unclean. Whoever touches the carcass of any of them shall be unclean until evening. Whoever carries part of the carcass of any of them shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. Let's stop there for a minute because touching dead carcasses is what it's talking about here. That potentially made someone unclean. Now, which carcasses made someone unclean? Unclean. That's what's going to be discussed in the rest of the chapter. That's going to be very well defined for us. Not every dead animal made necessarily someone unclean. Think about it. The priest dealt with dead animals on a regular basis every day. And so what makes the difference is, number one, if the animal died of natural causes versus being slain for sacrifice or slaughtered for food, that sort of thing. You know, every shepherd in Israel would have been doing this. Or two, if the animal was already considered unclean. The other thing to note before we move on is that the uncleanness passed on to the person is strictly temporary. You might notice it said that the person who touches the carcass shall be unclean until evening. Now, if you count it up from verse 24 all the way through verse 40, that idea is repeated no less than nine times. Now, although there are other cases of uncleanness, and we'll look at this in future weeks, that affected a person for days, weeks, months at a time, leprosy like in chapter 13 and following, touching a dead animal affected somebody for only a few hours. It was a safety measure to pre prevent the, the spread of potential disease, not necessarily necessary to quarantine someone off from the whole camp of Israel. Now with all that in mind, what does it mean to be made unclean? Because that word is used over and over and over again here. And the basic idea here is one of ritual impurity. Now, sometimes it's purely physical, right? There's a physical impurity that might take place when you're touching a dead carcass here. That's the case here. Other times, the word's used in a spiritual meaning. Remember when Isaiah had his vision of standing before the Lord God in his throne room in Isaiah chapter 6, and he said, I'm a people of unclean lips. I come from a nation of unclean lips. Isaiah 6, 5, same word for unclean, ritually impure, it's like with the abominable, detestable thing that we looked at earlier, this uncleanness required cleansing. Something had to intervene in that person's life to make him or her acceptable once more in the sight of God. And we need to remind ourselves that's exactly what we receive in Jesus. Without Jesus, we're unclean. We're stained by sin. We're muddied by our rebellion, unfit for use by the King of Kings. But that's when he intervenes. That's when he showers us with grace. Jesus washes us, cleanses us, clothes us with the purity of his own righteousness. righteousness. So now we can be used for his glory. Things around us make us stained. Jesus cleanses us. All right, so we pick up in verse 26. The carcass of any animal which divides a hoof but not a cloven hoof or does not chew the cud is unclean to you. Everyone who touches it shall be unclean. Whatever goes on its paws among all kinds of animals that go on all fours, those are unclean to you. Whoever touches any such carcass shall be unclean until evening. Whoever carries any such carcass shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. It is unclean to you. So here's the definition of the unclean, non-agricultural animals, very similar to what was considered edible or inedible. Right? If it neither had a divided hoof, it didn't chew the cud, can generally considered unclean. They could touch the animal while it's alive, but once the animal died, it renders the person temporarily unclean when touching it. Now, that would happen more often than we might initially think. We might think, okay, there are certain animals you just stay away from, you don't touch at all. Mountain lions, swine, you don't want to touch those things. But just because an animal was unclean for eating didn't mean that sometimes touching one of those dead animals wasn't necessary think that the Hebrews had donkeys and camels among them, which were unclean for eating, unfit for eating. But sometimes these animals, of course, would still die. And in these cases, the men would have to pick up the animal, carry it out for disposal, and thus they're rendered unclean until evening. I like that the fact that God addresses this at all is an act of his mercy, and it's a reminder of his goodness. Because sometimes, try as we might, there just seems to be no way that we can avoid some form of defilement. But that doesn't mean that 
fellowship with God is forever broken, he provides methods of cleansing. He provides mercies. Of course, how are we cleansed today? Well, through the simple thing of confession and faith. Now, you knew I was going to get here some point tonight, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There are times that we mess up, no matter how badly we're trying to avoid messing up. Sometimes we just do. But it doesn't mean we have to live forever with our guilt. It doesn't mean that we lose our salvation with God, like some people teach. We can be cleansed. We can be free. Simply confess. There may be things some of you guys have been holding on to far longer than what you needed to. Release it to Jesus through confession and be free. So you've got the large animals that we talked about. He's going to talk about the small animals or these creeping things, starting in verse 29. These also shall be unclean to you among all the creeping things that creep on the earth. The mole, the mouse, the large lizard after its kind, the gecko, the monitor lizard, the sand reptile, the sand lizard, the chameleon. These are unclean to you among all that creep. Whatever touches them when they are dead shall be unclean until evening. Creeping vermin, obviously, considered unclean. Now, the list could potentially be longer, but these are the creatures that the Hebrews would be most likely to encounter on a regular basis. And the idea is that if the animal is low to the ground, it's constantly dirty. Mice and rats are known to carry disease, right? The best thing to do is steer clear for them, from them, and that's what God commanded the Hebrews to do, which is a great application when it comes to sin, right? The best way to stay clear of sin, just avoid it altogether. Don't be around it, right? So verse 32, anything on which any of them falls when they're dead shall be unclean. Whether it's any item of wood or clothing or skin or sack, whatever item it is in any which in which any work is done, it must be put in water. And it shall be unclean until evening. Then it shall be clean. Any earthen vessel into which any of them fall, shall, you shall break, and whatever is in it shall be unclean. In such a vessel, any edible food upon which water falls become unclean, and any drink that may be drunk from it becomes unclean. There's extreme care that's taken for this cleanliness. If a vermin gets into anything, uh, you know, and it dies there, then these items are to be cleansed. Now, on a spiritual level, obviously it helps the people to uh, dedicate their devotion, demonstrate their devotion to God. They're showing they're being set apart by Him by taking care of to cleanse the stuff from their household. But on a practical level, it does guard the Hebrew people from disease. Now, when I was researching it today, because it's been a while since I've researched it, it does seem to be debated a little bit by modern scholars, but the, you might know that the bubonic plague or the Black Death in medieval Europe largely stayed out, not completely, but largely stayed out of the Jewish ghettos due to their adherence to these laws of cleanliness. Because flea-infested rats brought this plague with them, and the Europeans didn't take near the care that the Jews did to keep those things out of their sight. It goes to show God does have his reasons, right? We might not always understand why God has certain commands for us to obey, but we can know this much. God always has his reasons. And even what we don't understand, if we have faith that God knows what he's doing, then that gives us you know, the impetus to uh, just simply obey. Verse 35, And everything on which a part of any such carcass falls is unclean, whether it's an oven or cooking stove, it shall be broken down, for they're unclean, it shall be unclean to you. Nevertheless, a spring or cistern in which there's plenty of water shall be clean, but whatever touches any such carcass becomes unclean. So you've got a little difference between the wood and the linen items versus clay vessels. Because wooden linen, you can cleanse that pretty easily, but clay, you can't. It gets into the pores, and you better just to break it than to have the chance of it spreading disease. As for the spring or cistern, it seems you've got this continual replenishment of water. That's enough for them to be continually cleansed. Verse 37, and if a, any part of any such carcass falls on a planting seed, which is to be sown, it remains clean. But if water is on the seed, if any part of any such carcass falls on it, it becomes unclean to you. Right? Unsprouted seeds, it's safe don't want the dead animal on it, but it's safe. But if it sprouted, if it started that process, it needs to be thrown out. By the way, keep in mind that at the time that this law was given, no one was planting any seeds to, in Israel at the time, right? They're at the bottom, base of Mount Sinai, about to set off to the promised land, and then, of course, going to wander around in the desert for 40 years on their own. So you've got one more subtle promise from God of the grace that's yet to come. Because there will be a time that you're planting seeds. All right, so you've got all these unclean things, unclean animals, but what happens with edible animals? Verse 39, And if any animal which you may eat dies, 
He who touches its carcass shall be unclean until evening. He who eats of its carcass shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. He who carries its carcass shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. Even clean animals could still render a Hebrew temporarily unclean. Now again, remember, this isn't because it's slaughtered. It's not because it's slain and sacrificed. It's because it died of maybe disease or died of old age. So they're still taking a few precautions with these things. And it's just practical matters uh, for the people of Israel. Then we hone into verses 41 through 45. We see this interesting uh, contrast here. Verse 41. And every creeping thing which creeps on the earth shall be an abomination. It shall not be eaten. Whatever crawls on its belly, whatever goes on all fours, whatever has many feet among all creeping things that creep on the earth, these you shall not eat, for they are an abomination. You shall not make for yourselves abominable with any creeping thing that creeps, nor shall you make yourselves unclean with them, lest you be defiled by them. Now, considering we've already looked at creeping things in verses 29 through 31, why mention them again? Well, God emphasizes how these things shall be an abomination, an abomination. Interestingly, it, one of the, the qualifications here is anything that crawls, whatever crawls on its belly, brings to mind the serpent from the Garden of Eden, doesn't it? The basic idea is that the Hebrews are not to have anything to do with these pests. If it crawled, if it slithered, if it crept, or whatever, they're detestable. They're terribly defiling, and God's people were to stay far away from them. By the way, I think many of us can relate. You see a spider in your house, you want to get rid of it. I found that. This is how you get rid of a spider. All right? No spider around. Today, spiders don't make us unclean. They might creep us out. But there's a whole bunch of stuff in our world which does make us unclean. For the Hebrews, they've been warned about these animals already. They're doubly warned because of this abomination. Doubly warned because it's a detestable thing this defilement it would bring to them. And breaking one's fellowship with God wasn't worth the cost. Be warned of that. Neither it is with us. You know, there are things that are detestable around us. They shouldn't be flirted with by us. Even when we consider these things are only temporary, we can confess the sin and be cleansed. Why break our fellowship at all when we have the choice not to some of the things that we listen to, some of the things we choose to watch, some of the things that we take into our mind and hearts, these are those similar sorts of creeping things that we deal with and they bring defilement. Remember what Jesus said, we mentioned it earlier when he was talking about these dietary issues and defilement. He said this in Mark 7, verses 20 through 23, and he said, what comes out of a man, that defiles a man. Far from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. Why would we play around with the stuff that puts those things into our heart? Well, stay totally clear of it. Be rid of it. It's just not worth the cost. And we see why here in verse 44. For I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore consecrate yourselves, and you shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourself with any creeping thing that creeps on the earth. For I am the Lord who brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Here's the key to the entire section. In fact, here's the key to chapters 11 through 15. God is holy. He's pure. He's perfect. He's undefiled. He's as clean as clean can be. He's cleaner than any scrub-washed surgeon, cleaner than any sterile room. God is the very definition of purity. We know what pure is when we look at Almighty God. And because God is holy, God's people are to be holy. Now, this is going to be the ongoing theme of the rest of the book of Leviticus. Be holy, for I am holy. It's going to be repeated over and over again. Unless we think that this applies only to the Old Testament Hebrew, it carries over to the New Testament Christian Peter writes this, 1 Peter 1, 13 through 16, Therefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. As God's people were to act like our God. Not that we have his omnipotence and powers, of course not. We're not taking it to that extreme, but that we act according to his character. 
right? Because God is just, we are to love justice. Because God is loving and merciful, we're to be loving and merciful. And because God is holy, we are to be holy. We're to be set apart from the world around us, walking in purity, walking in light. And people say, well, of course I can't do that. I know me and I know that that's impossible. Well, you're right and you're in good company because it's impossible for all of us. But again, this is why we're so dependent on the grace and the power of Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit, because we cannot do this on our own. We have to entrust ourselves to Jesus to let him do it through us. It's about humility, surrender, faith. Now, do we act? Of course we do. We still say no to sin. We say yes to God. But we do so ever relying on God's power, always walking in his grace. So he sums it up with this little conclusion, verse 44, 46 and 47. This is the law of the animals and birds and every living creature that moves in the waters, every creature that creeps on the earth to distinguish between the clean and the unclean and the clean, between the animal that may be eaten and the animal that may not be eaten. You might recall that goes back to the command of God to Aaron after Nadab and Abihu died. He said that was going to be one of the jobs of the priests, Leviticus 10.10, 10, to distinguish between the unclean and the clean. So he says, okay, now I've shown you how to do it and how to teach Israel to do it. All right, so you've got diet, animal, husbandry on one hand. That's one area where the Hebrews could experience ritual impurity and be cleansed from that. There are others, things dealing with own physical person that can fall into that same sort of category, and we see it here with holiness and childbirth, uh, starting in verse 1. And then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, If a woman has conceived and born a male child, then she shall be unclean seven days. As in the days of her customary impurity, she shall be unclean. And on the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. She shall then continue in the blood of her purification 33 days. She shall not touch any hallowed thing, nor come into the sanctuary until the days of her purification are fulfilled. And we need to keep in mind when we read this that pregnancy and childbirth are not sinful. On the contrary, children are shown to be a blessing from the Lord. Humans, of course, were commanded by God to be fruitful and to multiply. Now that said, there's a lot of blood and fluid and all sorts of stuff that comes forward at the moment of birth. And those fluids leave a person temporarily but ritually unclean. Some have wondered if this is a sort of punishment for the mother. Uh, Not necessarily. It does somewhat call to mind the curse that's placed on the pain that comes with childbearing. But there's also a gift that's given to her here because she has quite a bit of time given to her where she can spend it with her and her newborn. She got seven days where nobody can come in and, and, and bug her at all. She can actually get some rest. And she got another, you know, 33 days before she has to go to the temple and do those sorts of things. Verse 5, but if she bears a female child, then she shall be unclean two weeks as in her customary impurity, and she shall continue in the blood of her purification 66 days. So you double the time of uncleanness. Uh, for the birth of a girl rather than the birth of a boy. Why? Scripture doesn't say. Um, Some scholars suggest that it anticipates the future flow of blood that comes through a girl when she reaches maturity, and that's a possibility. Um, Of course, there are certain cultural realities that are reflected in the Bible that have nothing to do with a person's value in Christ. Uh, The New Testament affirms, affirms that there's neither male nor female. We're all one in Christ Jesus, Galatians 3.28. In fact, that value is actually seen here when we get to the purification offering. When the days of her purification are fulfilled, whether for a son or a daughter, she shall bring to the priest a lamb of the first year as a burnt offering, and a young pigeon or a turtle dove as a sin offering to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then he shall offer it before the Lord, make atonement for her, she shall be clean from the flow of her blood. This is the law for her who is born a male or a female. So you've got that ritual time of impurity. Finally, she can go back to the tabernacle, and she can bring sacrifices there, a burnt offering, obviously consecration, sin offering. Now we'll talk about the, 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 the need for an offering in a minute, but the fact that the same offering is required for either a boy or a girl shows that each child had the same worth. So those who try to claim that, you know, the Bible shows one more valuable than the other by the time of ritual impurity, that's falsified by the fact that the same offering is brought for both, right? So God shows that here. Daughters are not seen as inferior in the eyes of God. He had his own reasons for requiring the longer, longer time. Why was the atonement required? Why do you have to have this at all? Well, obviously, you've got to be cleansed from the, the flow of blood. But think of it this way. We're all born with an inherent sinful nature, 
Romans 5 goes into great detail about that. We don't have time to get into tonight. Ephesians 2, 1 says we're dead in our trespasses. We're just born into those states. And this emphasizes the fact that we're born with this nature of sin. And from birth on, we need to be cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Verse 8 closes it out. And if she's not able to bring a lamb, then she may bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons. One is a burnt offering, the other is a sin offering. So the priest shall make atonement for her, she shall be clean. A little accommodation for the poor, and this should sound familiar to you if you're familiar with Joseph and Mary, because they did this exact regulation in Luke chapter 2, verses 22 through 24. Which, by the way, proves that the Magi and the wise men did not show up at the, the, you know, the manger in Bethlehem when they're still there. Because they would have had with the gold and the myrrh and the frankincense more than enough wealth to go out and purchase a lamb for this dedication. And the fact that they were poor enough to have to use two turtle doves shows that they didn't show up till later. Anyway, so God's people are supposed to be clean. That's the idea here. God's people are supposed to be holy. Why? Because, as we saw earlier, God is holy. That's the key to all of this. God's people are to reflect his character and his nature. God's people are to look like the God we worship. He called us out of darkness into the light. He brought us out of defilement into purity. Now we're to live in that light, and we're to glorify him on the first hand, and two, point other people to him in the same way. Now there's a lot of regulations here that we're going to see in these chapters and chapters to come for the Hebrews to follow. Would they commanded to do this? Yes. Would they fail? Without question, they would. You know, it could be careful as possible, but you might inadvertently touch a dead mouse. You might thoughtlessly eat a meal that's fixed by a foreigner or whatever. But it does not mean that the Hebrews forever cast out of fellowship with God, no longer welcomed into his presence. No, that's what the sacrifices were for. That's one of the reasons why God gave the priesthood. The people were bound to fail. It just underscored the need for how dependent they were on God's grace and his mercy. Those were the things in the law that showed them their need for God's goodness. And it's no different with us because we do fail constantly. We live in a world that is defiled. <laughs> no question about that. And although we are supposed to be in the world but not of the world, we still fail. We'll occasionally partake in the things that are detestable. And we'll trip up with things that are defiling. What does that do? It just reminds us how desperately we need Jesus. Jesus. The grace Jesus gave us cleansed us from our sins of the past. But the grace that he continues to give us continues to cleanse us from our sins of the present. He always makes us acceptable to God. If there's anything you need to confess tonight for his cleansing, then confess it, be done with it. Ask, be holy. We want to walk in purity. We want to walk in grace. All is a testimony to God. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for tonight. And I do thank you for how you call us to walk in purity because you love us and you want us to be in fellowship with you. I also thank you, Lord, that where it's impossible with us, you make it possible through Jesus. You cleanse us where we couldn't be cleansed. Uh, you, you make us pure where we had defiled ourselves. It's all by Jesus' grace. Thank you that he's done that for us. Thank you that the Holy Spirit empowers us to, to say yes to you in things we would never say yes to in the past. Lord, help us continue to do so. One, that we might glorify you, but two, that we might point others towards you as well as they see the difference in us. They see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.